Welcome to I've Decided is Community Networking and Learning, held on the first and third Thursday of every month from 8.30 to 10 a.m. Today's featured speaker is Brett Beachler, owner of Beachler's Car Care in Peoria, Illinois. Brett will be speaking on how to save over $100,000 over a lifetime of driving. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Community Networking and Learning. This might be the biggest group back in person we've had in a while, so that is awesome. And, uh, but, but we do love um, the fact that we are hybrid, so we have awesome guests on uh, Zoom as well joining us over there. So welcome everybody that's listening in. You're gonna be thrilled that you're here today. If you've never heard Brett speak, I've had the privilege of hearing him a few years ago and learned so much. And I was excited to know that I was driving a good car with my Honda van you are, you and are. I drove it till I couldn't drive it more than 20 miles an hour to get to the dealership with over 300,000 miles on it. Thanks to what I learned from Brett. And so he has basically, his, his whole life has been spent in the auto industry. You were born into it, right? Yeah, like your dad started Beachlers and you've been, you grew uh, grandpa started your grandpa. Beachlers. So, right. Yeah. So he has grown up in this industry. He's extremely knowledgeable about automobiles. We have our car service there. Um, their service is phenomenal. If you've not ever experienced it, I want to encourage you. We always love to shop local, even when the gas prices uh, go up. I still feel pretty, you know, it's like, okay, if I'm pumping gas at Beachlers, I'm like, at least I'm supporting the Beachlers. <laughs> we're, we're, I always say we're at the end of the food chain. So we don't have much. <laughs> There's not much margin in the gas. No, they literally make pennies off of gas. Is, I mean, that's, that's not right. where they make their money. So that's why I'm just saying. Um, uh, so I'm excited to have Brett Beachler here mm-hmm. to Thank speak you. to us and to teach us how we can save over a hundred thousand dollars over our lifetime in in the cars that we drive and mm-hmm. and what we do so uh without further ado i will turn it over to you brett yes, we are recording much. and it's awesome so people that can't watch button. it's recording okay. yep so <laughs> if you're watching the recording uh as a member it's a privilege that you get to do this and we're excited that you're taking advantage of it uh taking advantage of one of the opportunities that you have as a member to watch the recording so enjoy and we missed you in person so maybe next time you'll show up in person all right awesome okay thank there you very you go, much Kim. okay good morning everyone um i've taken this show on the road for many years um you know one of the things i like to do is stretch people's minds because uh, the the adage used to be hey my car's got a hundred thousand miles on it i gotta get rid of it um cars are made so much better than they used to be i know people complain about them but in the end they don't get six miles of the gallon anymore. They don't have to be serviced every couple months. Um, you know, it used to be we were replacing spark plugs every 10,000 miles. Now most cars are 100,000 miles. So in those arenas, we're very, very thankful. So I love to stretch minds. Uh, one of the things that you guys heard on the on the uh, the topic is how do I save $100,000 on cars? And we'll get to that. I've got a really geeky spreadsheet that I show you that uh, I developed a couple, few years ago, and I've shared it around the country on podcasts. I've shared it um, with other dealers. We're actually involved with a 20 group of 89 other shops around the country, just iron sharpening iron, trying to help each other get better at what we do, um, improve our people, improve our leadership of the team, uh, things of that nature. But I have three friends around the country that are kind of my mentors, uh, one in Eugene, Oregon, he's got four shops, one in Toledo, Ohio, he's got three shops. And then one in uh, Augusta, Georgia, he's got two shops. So I got a lot of, I got a lot of wisdom I can glean from and they, they glean from me too. So this presentation is usually an hour. I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. And there are going to be some things that I want you to either remember or write down. You don't have to necessarily write them down, but you know, it's kind of like going to church. You know, we listen to a sermon for 45 minutes or an hour and usually remember one or two or three things. And this is, this is going to be information overkill a little bit, but it's also going to be good information you're going to walk away from. One thing I did do is I brought along my book. I'm going to give this away to everybody. And for those online, there's actually a PDF on our website. You can have it, or you can stop by the uh, business if you're in town sometime, and I'll give you a copy. Um, we usually sell it for $10, but it is, it's so valuable to us. It's, it's almost like an advanced business card to me because um, there are so many things that we teach customers throughout every day that um, it's, it's rote memory for us, 
but a lot of people walk away going, what did he just say? Like he just said, if I change my habits, I can save a hundred thousand dollars over life of cars. Okay. How do I do that? Um, so I'll try to go through this really quickly. Uh, why are you not advancing? Okay. Vehicle costs. Um, the biggest killer on cars. And most of you know this, cause I bet you guys have a lot of wisdom between the 10 of you. Uh, depreciation is the absolute biggest killer of a vehicle. Um, a couple of big numbers you should remember. The average new car loses 30% of its value in 365 days. So imagine that number. The next number is the average new car loses 60% of its value in four years. So guess when I buy cars, when they're four years old, that's when I buy a car. Um, so uh, that is one key thing to take away. So um, this is interesting. What happens on depreciation costs and cost per mile? I'm huge on cost per mile. Um, you know, I, I was watching a video on a Bugatti. Anybody ever heard of what a Bugatti is? One of the fastest cars in the world. One of the most expensive cars in the world. It costs about $10,000 a mile to operate this car. It is absolutely ridiculous, but that's for the people who are not in this room and not me. It is incredible the amount of cost. So you go to the average car. So the government right now gives us about 54 and a half cents a mile for using our car for business. And that 54 and a half cents per mile is absolutely legit because you start adding up costs per mile between the maintenance, the tires, um, the depreciation, which is the biggest killer. So like this first number, 75,000 miles, if you buy a car for $20,000, it costs you 26 and a half cents a mile in depreciation alone on that car. So these are some numbers you, these, you don't necessarily have to memorize, but I, I, wanna, I want you to understand when you start stretching out these, these costs of the depreciation costs, look what happens when a car reaches 250,000 miles. You're at eight cents a mile depreciation. So, and I'm okay. If somebody comes to me and says, you know, Brett, I like to buy a new car every two, three years. I'm like, okay, I, I just want you to understand what goes into buying new cars and where you take that. I look at new car buyers as my offensive line the, and I'm the quarterback. I'll let them take the hit and then I buy the car because to me, a car is just a tool to me. So Dave Ramsey has a line. He said, the only people who should be buying new cars are people with a million dollar net worth or more because they can absorb a hit like that. They can absorb buying a car for hundred thousand dollars and it's worth 40,000 in four years. They can absorb that. Um, but if anybody has ever read the book millionaire next door, what is his one formula that he talks about in that book? Use cars. Don't ever have a new car because you might as well put it in some something appreciating like a house versus a car. So uh, you go to fuel costs. We're at about well, we're not really three twenty anymore, but um, thirty mile a gallon car gets about you got to pay about ten and a half cents per mile if you get a fifteen mile per gallon car, which is fine. Does anybody know where the history of SUVs came from? The station wagon business started going in the tank way back three four decades ago. And they said, how do we get a car that we can sell and stroke the ego of the guys and be able to sell a car? So they developed the SUV, sport utility vehicle, which most people don't necessarily use it for off-roading. Um, the, the, the SUV was born and their sales exploded. Ford, pretty much all they ever sell now is trucks and SUVs because that's where their, their gross profit money is. There's not much in sedans anymore. So I'm not saying don't buy an SUV at all but they're a high cost per mile car to operate, higher cost per mile car to operate. So um, I will go through this quickly. Tire costs, about $600 the average set. That's about a penny per mile. I always have a joke with people when they're buying tires from us. I'm like, they're like, oh my gosh, tires are so expensive. And I look at their shoes and I go, you know, shoes are about 20 times more expensive than tires. They're like, no, they're not. I'm like, yeah, they are. I said, how many miles do you get out of running shoes? 500, 700, maybe. 160 bucks every three months takes care of her feet. I'm not knocking that. I'm a runner too, but they're way more expensive than buying four tires for your car. When you average out the, exactly. We won't start there either. Cause um, insurance about a thousand dollars a year, six and a half cents per mile, 6.8 cents per mile. Factory maintenance on most cars is about four cents per mile. Um, some cars are a little bit less. Some cars are a little bit more European cars. I'm not opposed to them, but they're going to be a little bit more per mile to operate on European cars just because of what they require, the different fluids, the different 
um, procedure times on doing things on European cars. I have friends that have European cars, but I also tell them you get to write me bigger checks. So I'm okay with them, but I just want you to know going into it, eyes wide open. Um, and anybody has any questions throughout this thing, if something piques your interest and you want to ask a question, I always use these car care clinics as a time for people to go, I've got the guy here in the room. I'm not in front of my advisor, which is kind of intimidating when you're one-on-one -on -one because you kind of feel like you don't know much and he knows a lot or she knows a lot. And sometimes it's intimidating to ask that question. Please feel free. That, I, we answer questions all day long. And we'll have time at the end too. Write it down. Um, the, some of the operational costs on, on vehicles, you know, you look through this, a lot of people like to see this because you start looking at certain cars, you look at the SUV, you know, you're looking at 73 cents a mile to operate the average SUV. Again, I'm not opposed to these cars. I just like people to go into these decisions, eyes wide open. My oldest daughter, she's a nurse. I was talking to somebody about her being a nurse down at OSF. Um, she just got on life flight. So she's so excited absolutely refuses to drive a minivan it's a stigma and i'm like okay you're gonna spend more money but that's your thing you got a husband and two kids but she is not gonna drive a minivan she doesn't want that stigma but i'm like is it gonna cost you more money i just want you to know that i don't care and that's okay you can only teach them so much you know brianna right you remember brianna so um anyway so let that sink in i just like people to see that the, you know, the smaller sedan, of course, is going to be less expensive. You could play that out into different cars, too. I look at the Toyota Corollas, Corollas their whole line of uh, models. That is one of the lowest uh, cost per mile car to operate out there. Hondas are up there, too. Ford actually makes a good, really good product. You start getting into certain models. I, I've, a, I've been asked hundreds of times, hey, I'm looking for a midsize SUV. What should I, what are my top three? I'll tell them the top three because... I'm not here to make money off this stuff. I'm here because I want to treat you like my brother, my sister, my mom. What would I tell them too? I would tell them the exact same thing. You know, so I had a guy come to me the other day. I'm looking for a midsize SUV and I'm like, Toyota RAV4, you got the Honda CRV and you got the Ford Escape. All of them really good cars, very low repair rate for us that we see. I have no problem telling people stuff like that. So in the end, people are like, what's, what's in it for you? I'm like, I don't care. I, I really don't care. We've, we've got a large amount of business and we keep getting more business. But at the same time, I don't want to guide you to a car that's going to cost you 80 cents a mile to operate. That's not fun for me because I'm a, I'm a budgeting freak. You ask my wife, she like, thinks I'm a whack job. But <laughs> I, I think budgets are very important and, and everybody's got an automobile budget, whether they like it or not. So um, anyway. So here's the, here's the big thing that I, this is the thing that I shared. Um, and I want to go back to a spreadsheet that I'll show you once I'm done with this, but I shared, I've shared on a couple of podcasts. I've shared it throughout the country. Um, you look at the operating costs of vehicles. It's a huge amount of money over a lifetime between the purchase, the, de the depreciation that goes into it, the next car you get, all the maintenance, all the uh, tires that you buy, the insurance, the license, everything that goes into it. This is an average number, but it's a lot of money to operate a car over a lifetime. That's why I don't get into cars. People laugh. I think cars are great. They're a tool to me. I live a half mile from my business. And what do I do every day? I walk to work. I walk to work. And everybody's like, everybody's like, everybody's like, you walk to work. I'm like, yeah, why would I start a car for a half mile? It's actually hard on cars to start them for a half mile and then shut them down. They don't like that. Um, Exhaust systems don't like it. They're certain they just like to get up and run and go for a little bit and then shut down. So um, we only have one car between my wife and I and my daughter's got a car. Everybody's like, really? I'm like, I don't need a car. I don't, I really don't need a car. I got a company truck that I can use whenever I need to. It's a plot, whatever. But if anybody can operate like that, I, I encourage you to do it. I'm not, it's not for everybody, but I also know how much of an expense that I eliminate over a lifetime, half a million bucks gone. I don't have to operate a car. So anyway, food for thought. Factory specified maintenance. Okay, I'm going to tell you a couple things on this and then we'll move on. Owner's manual is your Bible, the vehicle, period. Don't deviate from it. I can't tell you how many times that we've gone through and I've done a Carfax review on, on vehicles and I look through and I'm like, hmm, fuel injection cleaning, didn't have to do that. There's 150 bucks. We call those wallet flushes. 150 bucks, somebody sold them they didn't need to do. Do you have a question? Okay. I thought you had a question. Sorry. 
Um, I did a, a, a review on a gentleman not too long ago. I went through his Carfax and I said, do you know, do you realize you spent uh, $625 you didn't have to spend on that car? And he goes, what? I said, there are things in that Carfax review that I found that you shouldn't have to spend your money on. So 625 bucks is not a drop in the bucket. But somebody, what happens in our industry is people believe, and I have guys in my 90 group and I've told them, don't sell that stuff. It's not right. It's not the right thing to do. They have their own opinion as to what needs to be done on vehicles. But our opinion is, and a lot of good shops opinions are, the engineers of the car put this together. They put the owner's manual together. Their job is to help prolong the components of your car. So for example, spark plugs on your Honda are probably 105,000 mile interval. They're platinum plugs. They're designed to last that long. There's no reason Kim has to replace your spark plugs at 60,000 miles. Shouldn't have to do it. Um, a lot of domestic vehicles, um, GMs, uh, Fords, Chryslers don't have to do brake fluid exchanges on it, any of them. You should never have to walk into a place and go, hey, you need a brake fluid exchange. Why do I need that? Well, we feel the, you know, they'll pull out the little strips and we feel it needs to be done. You don't have to do that stuff. Um, so I really try to encourage people to follow their owner's manual and what the engineers put together to help that car last as long as it possibly could. So, okay. Um, she did differently this time. Uh, other maintenance to consider most cars don't have fuel filters anymore. They're tucked inside the fuel tank. You just don't have to do that type of maintenance. Um, cabin air, cabin ventilation filters are kind of like your furnace filter at home. They ventilate the air coming into the car. The, the good thing about cabin filters, everybody goes, well, it's just another expense on my car. Well, what they do is they protect an evaporator core, which is a thousand dollar piece of equipment when those get debris on them. So it keeps that debris from getting on the evaporator core, but then you got to replace the filter about every 30,000 miles. Wipers, the biggest enemy of wipers is not rain and snow. It's sun. That's what kills the rubber. So if your car sits outside a long time during the day, your wipers are just not going to last as long. I always explain that to people. You know, we come in and say, hey, you need wipers or torn on the end. Why just replace those last year? I'm like, well, does it sit outside? Good morning. How are you? Good. Um, so just something to, something to consider. Uh, coolant. The big thing about coolant anymore, the antifreezes in your engine, it's not necessarily about temperature protection, which is kind of the the way a lot of people used to think because you'd have a 50 below protection go to like 20 degrees and at 20 degrees if it goes to 15 you could crack the block of your engine that pretty much never happens anymore what coolant is there for is an anti-corrosion ability um, to keep the fluid inside the engine that's what keeps the engine cool at all times um, what it's there for is to prolong the life of all the components that are in there so the, the reason why you'd want to do a coolant exchange is you don't want your $600 radiator to fail. That's, that's, it's called preventative maintenance for a reason. So, um, warranties. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to cut to this part here. So you see that second bullet point? I've been asked this question probably 500 times in my career. Should I buy an extended warranty? That's what I go to every time. This is consumer reports. They did a research on this a few years ago, the average person who puts $1,000 into an extended warranty gets $700 in return. Would we put our money into any kind of investment? We know we're going to lose 30% value. <laughs> Take that money. I always encourage my customers, put it into a maintenance account, put it off to the side, don't pay attention to it, but you're not going to get your money back in an extended warranty. Those companies are so sharp and they're so good at what they do that they will weasel everything they possibly can. When we make phone calls to these companies, they will weasel everything they can. They'll tell the customer it's a hundred dollar deductible and the customer ends up walking out paying two, $250 because of their exclusionary things they won't pay on vehicles. And we look at it as, as a company, we look at it as, okay, we'll handle your extended warranty company, but I develop a good relationship with Kim and I call Kim up and I say, hey, Kim, your car needs this, this, and this. Right now it's immediate, these are down the road. And Kim trusts me and it's a five minute conversation. I will call these extended warranty companies and I'll have to spend 30 to 45 minutes on the phone with them. And who pays for that? The customer. It's not fair to a company to have to be on the phone with a company that long for them to go through all their hoops to be able to pay for that stuff. So that's a minor part of it, the phone call. The major part of it is not a hundred dollar deductible usually. They're usually nickeling you for more and more and more money because they're in this to make money. They're not in this to be your friends. 
they sound really genuine on the commercials, but they're, they sound so good. And then they start calling your mobile phone to get your extended warranty after you buy. I'm like, really? I mean, come on. So anyway, I, anytime I, and it, the other deal is it sounds really enticing when you buy a car and you finance a car, which is, if you can get away from that, I would encourage you to, but how they do it is they go, okay, your car payments, uh, $472 a month, which the average car payment is 486 a month. People are paying now. And then for $30 more, we can add this extended warranty. And, and, and for 30 bucks, the average person sitting there, going, oh, big deal, 30 bucks. That's not that big of a deal. And then you work it out, amortize it over five years of time. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money that you're never, you, you're going to get, you know, 70% of it back, but you're not going to get 120% of it back, which is what everybody's going into it thinking. But the key to remember is cars are made so much better anymore. You just don't see these, these, that's why they're making out so well as these companies. So anyway, that's one of the points for every thousand dollars invested, you get $700 in return. So I like people to understand that. Um, red lights, generally the overview of this red lights generally are, are critical items. If you get a red light on your dashboard, it's time to shut down. Orange lights are generally a warning. Most of the time when a check engine light comes on, it's not critical that you get a lot of panic people that call into us. Oh, my check engine lights on, I, you know, we'll stop by, give them a guidance scan, stuff like that. But usually it's an efficiency code. Usually it's affecting uh, the fuel economy on a car. It's not critical error type stuff where the car is going to shut down and break down on you. If a, if a check engine light is blinking, then that could be an issue. Um, that is typically an issue you want to take to your, your uh, preferred shop. Um, one thing I like to teach people on this, most everybody's cars in here have an oil life indicator. Would you agree? I think most everybody has an indicator. And you also have an oil level light, which is red. Indicator's yellow or orange. They don't talk to each other. So one of the biggest misnomers in our world is that people come in with no oil on their dipstick. And they say, my oil light didn't come on. My oil life indicator didn't, light didn't come on. I say, that has nothing to do with the oil level, period. Oil life indicator is a statistical model built into the vehicle's computer system that measures start cycles, run cycles. It's very smart. And it tells you if you're a really short trip person and you get in your car and you go two miles, two miles, two miles, two miles, your oil is going to break down sooner than if you were to live in Brimfield and you commute into Peoria every day on I-74. Oil is going to last a lot longer. Um, because that's easier on the engine. So oil level and oil life do not talk to each other. So I encourage people to check the oil level, even with newer cars on a somewhat regular basis. I would say usually once or twice in between oil changes is safe, but I've got, we've got a handful of customers that come in once a month for their pit stops and we're adding oil every 1500, 2000 miles. So oil life, oil level, they don't talk to each other. Okay. Um, pre-trip inspection, pre-purchase, super wise. I've had people come in for pre-purchase inspections on cars that we have located $2,000, worth of work where they were just about ready to buy the car for the asking price that they had. And they would have been in a pickle because they would have gotten top dollar for the asking price and then had to turn around and put $2,000 into the car. It is very wise investment wherever you take it to whatever shop you take it to it is always wise to do pre-purchase inspection usually 120 bucks at our place and i'm not trying to promote us i'm trying to educate you to go please do it because generally speaking on a used car you're going to find something that they send through their inspection process but it's they're not looking out for you they're looking out for themselves they just don't want things falling off and looking terrible when somebody buys a car they're usually bring it up to their par, not necessarily up to the par that you want it to be. So um, if a pre-purchase or a pre-trip inspection is not road tested, it's not a worthy inspection. Well, isn't it true also that um, dealers will make more money on a used car? Yes. Than they yeah. on a new car. Huh? The only way they make money on a new car is volume. That's it. So if they sell, well, it's volume. Serv they, service is getting big. Yeah, yes. service is getting money too, yeah. But if they sell 40, new cars, yeah. then they're making money. But if they sell, you know, 40 used cars, then yes. they're really making money. Yes, that's yeah. exactly right. There's more gross profit on yeah. uh, used cars than there are new cars, which as they should be. It's like I, I, I've told customers, they say, well, I want to sell my, or I'm going to trade my car. And I'm like, okay, that's going to cost you $1,500 or $2,000. Like what? And I said, usually lose 1500 to 2000 If you hand the keys over to somebody and give them the selling process versus you taking on the selling process. 
I'm not trying to promote selling process because that can be an arduous process. Having people come to your house, I, that that's the scary part. Like if I ever sell a car, I meet them at my business. Uh, they do not come to my house. No offense to them. I trust everybody, but I don't trust situations like that. I don't trust everybody. Um, you know, all I, you've read too many reports. Yeah, you've read too many reports where people are, you know, bad things happen. So if you're going to sell your car, do it in a neutral location um, during the day. I always tell people that. But it is a nice deal to hand off your keys to somebody else and have them do the process. It is nice. But sometimes people don't understand that it costs them $1,500 to $2,000 to because they reduce the value of your car is what they do, as they should. They, I mean, they're taking on a risk, selling a car, you don't necessarily know what's wrong with it or what it needs. Um, talking to your shop, write everything down. You know, a lot of, lot of things happen in our industry in terms of uh, noises. Cars develop noises over time. I mean, we develop noises over time too. Our human bodies, why wouldn't cars who are, our bodies are made much better than cars are. Um, the big thing is description when you go to your shop is the best description you possibly can give your, your uh, advisor on something like that. So, um, okay, I'm trying to run through this quickly. Body maintenance, keep droppings off the car. Cars have clear coats now. Bird droppings will burn through clear coats over time. Keep those off. Um, power wash fender areas to keep the grime up because what happens in, in fender areas is um, if you get a lot of dirt and debris that's stuck up, up in that area, it can cause rust over time. Um, regular car soap, dish soap is not necessarily good for the clear coat. Um, one of the things I refer to is kbb.com when you're trying to figure out the value of a car you're buying or the value of the car you're selling. That is what that is my go to every time. When somebody says, Hey, how much do you think my car's worth? I go, kbb.com put it on all your trim levels, you put, you know, the model number, everything on the car that you want to put in there and ask you how many miles are on it. And, it'll, and it tells ask your zip code too, in terms of where you, um, where you're at, and it'll tell you the approximate value of the car. So um, not that everybody's getting into the selling business. Um, why rotate? Um, we see this a lot in our um, climate is we have a lot of, oops, we have a lot of, um, corrosion that develops between the alloy rim and the steel hub assembly. So literally we have to remove those wheels by force. And if you're not rotating regularly, that, that corrosion that develops will get even bigger and bigger and bigger. So if you're on the, the reason I tell you that if you're on the side of the road, you're probably not going to be able to get your wheels off if you got a flat tire. Um, I mean, it, it is just brutal. These guys take tools and they're trying to get the wheels off. It just takes power and force to get them off. And usually when it's up on those, those little puny jacks, it, you're not going to get it off. So that's why we encourage regular rotations is to keep that um, uh, corrosion off. And we, we actually have tools to remove the corrosion when it does happen. So uh, quality tires should last 45 to 60,000 miles. We sell some tires that are like 80,000 miles, which I always tell people the, the mileage game in the tire world, it's just a, it's a marketing shill is what it is. Because the bottom line is, I don't know if anybody ever saw the movie Days of Thunder, probably you saw it, the guy saw it. This guy took this deal in there and he goes, I want you to drive 50 laps your way and 50 laps my way. And when he drove his way, the driver's way, he wore the tires out like immediately just because he was so aggressive of a driver. So point being is I can take a car and I can go, I can drive that car 80,000 miles. I can get 80,000 miles out of them. But if I want to drive like a typical teenage kid, I'll get 20,000 miles. It's just a physics game. The average the tires will actually last forever. If we eliminated three variables, turning, accelerating and steer or, and braking. Those three are what wear tires out. If you were to drive on the interstate at 70 miles an hour and never do any of those things, they would last forever. So that's just how tires work. Um, so, okay. Um, your pressure, this is the topical deal on this one. Um, a lot of people have tire pressure monitors in the car and they come on like this time of year and they're really annoying. So a couple factors for every 10 degree drop, and ambient temperature, tires lose one pound. So you drop 40 degrees overnight, they're gonna lose four pounds. Usually it takes about uh, three to five to illuminate those lights. That's why. Um, so uh, the tire specifications on how much air to put in, you ever open your driver's door, there's a little placard down there, usually white, yellow, red. That's how much air you wanna put in your tires. Don't look at the sidewall of the tire that says up to 44 pounds, for example. 
you know, some cars will be 30 and then car customers will come in with 44, 45 pounds in their tires. That's not the, the engineers put that tire pressure together because that's the ideal handling pressure they want in their car, period. Don't deviate from that. And ideal handling and um, miles per gallon too. It's on your driver. It's like a pillar on your driver's door. Most cars it's located there. It's like a sticker. Inside? Yep, inside your door. You open the door and you look down and you kind of have to look like old people like us. You got to look through our readers to see it. So I'll be out there in the shop helping the guys and they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, trying to see the number just right through the reader of my, my glasses. They're all like, you're old. Um, okay, so tread depth indicators. Everybody probably knows this, but there's a bar on your tires when the tread depth gets down so low and uh-oh. And uh, um, so that's that's typical 100% run out on tires. Okay. It's okay. It's all right. Uh, when repairing tires, I don't know if people know this, but the, the manufacturer preferred way to repair a tire is with a patch on the inside. It preserves the integrity of the tire. You can go to places that have plugs, but what they do is they actually expand the hole and they can affect the steel cords of the tire. So um, anyway, so not the ideal way to do it. A little bit more expensive to do a patch, but it preserves the integrity of the tire. Okay. How many think when they have a pull problem in their car? that it's an alignment issue. It's a misnomer in our, in our world. And don't feel bad if you think it is. 99% of pole problems are caused by a tire and there's a uh, like a belt separation internally inside the tire that causes it. So what we don't wanna do is you go into a shop and you go, hey, I need an alignment. And the average shop goes, okay, we'll do an alignment. And then they get finished with the alignment. It's a hundred bucks. They get finished with the alignment and you drive away and you still got a pull problem. And people go, wait, you just did an alignment on my car. Why does my car have a pull problem? Well, you didn't tell us that. So anytime a customer calls us and says, I need alignment, we go, why do you think you need alignment? And usually the next line is, well, it's got a pull to the left or the right. Okay, well, let's stop right here because I'm going to take your money and it's not going to fix anything. So pull problems are usually caused by tires 98, 99% of the time. Very rare, probably once or twice a year, we get a car that's got such a bad alignment issue that it's causing a pull issue. Tire pressure, also tire pressure can if you got a really deviant tire pressure in terms of like 35 and one and 17 the other on the front tires it'll cause a pull pull to the left yes so good point uh wipers i always encourage people to just clean wipers every once in a while i'm a stickler on glass i think glass when it's really dirty and filthy and you get all that slime on the inside it's hard to see at night and especially as i age it just i don't like anything on my windows. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't like anything on my windows. Um, so I, and I used to detail cars in college just for extra money. And the trick is to use newspaper and Windex and they don't streak. And as, so I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of, does he? Yeah. It's just the ultimate way to do it. People laugh. I mean, your hands are black when you're finished, but the windows are crystal clean. Or a Norwex window towel. That does it too. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, I'll remember that now. Um, let me get to. I want to get because we're almost out of time. I want to get uh, to. <laughs> these are kind of topical things. Set your mirrors. Okay, so. It makes sense to put the premium gas in. No. No. no, only if the car calls for it. Well, I mean, even before the gas prices went crazy. Um, it, unless they're, they're looking for the octane out of the fuel. It, that's really what cars that require the higher octane, the 93. They're looking for the performance out of it. That's why they require it. But it doesn't necessarily make good sense for that. Funny you said that. Yeah. So I call these wallet flushes. I have saved, we have saved customers more money. You shake a stick at Nitro Junior tires. I did research for us to take this on. Like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the research, find out what's going on here. Should we sell it or not? In the end, I was like, there's no way I can sell this to my customers. The average, you and I breathe about 78% nitrogen. They can only guarantee about 95 to 96% purity in the nitrogen in their tires. Their point, the reason why they sell it is they say the molecules are bigger and you'll stop leaks from occurring in your tires. 
if you're going to nail in the tire, there is not, there's no molecule big enough that's going to stop a leak from coming out of your tire. Bead leaks, which is pretty common, it's an oxidation of the tire. Nitrogen is going to leak out of that too. The only time nitrogen is beneficial is in race car tires. They have these, I don't know if you ever see them, they're big green tanks that come alongside. They're 100% nitrogen. That's the only time because they are dealing with some different temperatures than you and I are dealing with on tires. And then hydraulic jet lines is all they ever use pure nitrogen. So don't be sold. It's only 20 bucks. I get it, but don't be sold the nitrogen and tires. Fuel injection cleaning. Their uh, engines called GDI. Uh, they're gas direct in injection engines. I'm not a fan of them, but they require fuel injection cleaning. There are no other engines out there that require injection cleanings. So don't spend your money on that. Usually it's hundred to 120 to 150 dollars. Save your money. Um, something that's kind of going away is the gas and oil additives. You just, we never have people do it. It's not necessary. I mean, it's only usually six or seven or ten dollars for a bottle, but it's it's not necessary. We already talked about extended warranties, uh, gas saving con uh, contraptions. You're starting to see those go away. Power steering and brake fluid exchanges. Most vehicles don't require these things. Um, it's not a lot of money. Brake fluid exchanges are 130 bucks, but Hondas require it. Nissan, there's some Nissans, there are some GMs that require it who have European chassis on their vehicles, but a lot of European cars require it. But other than that, the most domestic cars and most Asian cars don't require brake fluid exchanges. Just save your money. You don't need to do that. Power steering flushes, they're gonna, they're gonna come up and they're gonna bring you the tray that's got the new fluid versus the old fluid. But the bottom line is we never see power steering systems fail because they're not exchanging the fluid out of the power steering. So 3,000 mile oil changes, if you're still getting that, it is absolutely a thing of the past. That has been gone for 20 years. Uh, most cars are minimum 5,000 miles. You know, Hondas are, and, and the oil life indicators, that's really the science of the car. Um, Hondas, Toyotas are 7,500 miles. Nissans are 7,500 miles. Most cars are 7,500 miles. You just don't, if somebody's trying to sell you on getting in every three months, 3,000 miles, you should be walking away. Even non-synthetic. Non our, our full conventional mobile oil goes 5,000 miles. It is absolutely unnecessary. Um, Mid-grade premium fuel is not necessary unless your car uh, demands it. Um, <clears throat> overzealous air filter replacement. The, the, the only time you should replace an air filter is if you can't see fluorescent light through it. That's the true test of filters on um, air filters for the engines. So uh, ethanol, we could, I could have a whole class on ethanol. This is the biggest political boondoggle you've ever seen. And guys like Ray LaHood bought right into it. And it is absolutely, I mean, there's, there's, I, I have a whole presentation I do on ethanol and how useless it is. Makes the farmers feel good. Farmers are their pawns. Ethanol's, it, we're taking food and turning it into fuel and third world countries look at us like we're whack. Um, anyway, so <laughs> you can see where I stand on that stuff. Um, okay, so some of the stuff is really not, necessary when do i sell body integrity is compromised you know the bottom line is if you got a frame or a body starting to rust out and you got big repairs going on with the car we'll guide our customers to go okay time to retire um and it happens around here i have friends with shops in the south they, their cars last three four hundred thousand miles because they don't have the rust and salt and debris on the road okay so yeah I'd rather buy a car from the South, to be honest with you, if I was going to buy a used one. Um, let me show you, I, I'm not going to go through this because this, we could talk about this for 30 minutes. I want to show you this um, spreadsheet I built. And I'm, I'm totally happy to share this with anybody. So all I did, this will be my last part. All I did was I took buying a brand new car versus buying a four-year-old car. So you look at down here, you look at a cost per mile right here of about four cents a mile on a brand new car, maintenance wise. Okay, everybody goes, ooh, that looks pretty good. That's not bad, four cents a mile. And then I go and I bought a used, you buy a used car and I take all these numbers, I know I'm nerdy. It's about twice that maintenance and repairs, give or take, okay? There's the big one. This is the, the, the compare them side by side sheet. So you take the cost of a new car, I don't know if you got a clicker on this thing, but I'll try to go through this 34,000 it depreciates 60 percent you can change all all this yellow is are variables you can change all these somebody drives 15,000 miles a year 
Um, license costs in Illinois is 151 bucks. Insurance costs 1500, give or take on a brand new car. Fuel costs 250, you can take that up to whatever it is now. So you get you come down here and you see the operational expenses of a new car. Okay, $460,000 on this particular model over 50 years of time. Then I'm the guy that comes in and buys it at $13,600. And then I run it for 12 and a half years, okay? A lot of same operational expenses, licenses, the insurance goes down a little bit, repair costs go up, you got your fuel costs, you got your miles per gallon, and then you take this. I'm not a finance guy, but this is the money savings over 50 years time. If I were to, if I were to change my habit from a new car, sell it every four years to a used car, buy it at four years old, keep it 12 and a half years. That is, um, okay, I'll do that. How do I dismiss this? He was spreadsheet week too. Is he? Okay, cool. No, it got dismissed. We're good. We're good. Kim. Okay. So if I were to invest this money over 50 years time, I'm not a financial expert. It would not be $124,000 at the end of 50 years. It'd be more like a hundred a half million dollars is what I've been explained to by financial gurus. They say it'd be a half million dollars, Brett. If you invested it at 8% interest, blah, 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 $2,000 a year, Flip your money, don't invest your money in your car, put it in a retirement fund or whatever you want to do. That's four to five hundred thousand dollars is what I'm telling people. So I do this not to 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 slam people who are buying new cars. If you want to buy a new car, by all means do it. But I want you to go into it eyes wide open to go, okay, if I change my habit, if I buy a car, a quality used car four years old and I keep it 12 years, this changes the scope of people li people's lives as far as I'm concerned. Again. I'm okay if you want to buy a new car, but go into it totally transparent and knowing exactly what it's going to cost you over time to have a new car. So with that said,